Dear fellow gender champions, dear colleagues, dear friends. My name is Annika Markovic and I'm Sweden's ambassador to the Netherlands. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar, co-organized by the embassies of Sweden and Canada in The Hague in cooperation with CARE Netherlands. Today's webinar will focus on the impact of COVID-19 and quarantine measures on women, in particular the increased risk of domestic violence. Joining us are experts from Canada, the Netherlands and Sweden. Before we open the panel discussions, please allow me to share a few comments on the current situation. The COVID-19 pandemic impacts us all in different ways. However, some individuals are more affected than others. As in any crisis, those in the most vulnerable situations and those with the least power and resources are subjected to the most severe stress. Evidence from many countries around the world shows that violence in close relationships increases when people live in isolation due to the pandemic and that women and children are the most at risk. It would be naive to think that our three countries, Sweden, Canada and the Netherlands, are exceptions. We therefore need to acknowledge the risk and respond to the new challenges in a gender and child responsive manner. The Swedish government agencies, local and regional authorities and civil society organizations such as women's shelters have already reported an increase in cases of domestic violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. My government has therefore taken several new measures to prevent and protect against domestic violence including grants of 10 million euros to civil society organizations. My colleague Ola Florin from the Swedish Ministry of Employment will tell you more about the measures taken by the Swedish government later. I'm really looking forward to an interesting and fruitful discussion. So thank you very much for joining our webinar. And I would like, la, now like to hand over to Ambassador Lisa Helfand of Canada. Lisa. Hi, thank you, Annika. And thank you all for taking part in this call today. It's very important. For many of us, we're lucky to participate from the comfort and safety of our homes, but it's important for us to remember that for many, home is not a safe place. We're learning that COVID-19 and quarantine may increase substance abuse, aggravate mental health issues, and create new financial stresses. And sadly, all of these factors are known to increase the risk of domestic violence. At the same time, quarantine measures may mean that victims of domestic violence are often locked in with their abusers. When it's harder to leave the house, it's harder to access friends, family, or public resources. And in addition, there may be new health risks with accessing abuse shelters or getting medical attention. So the question we're all working to answer is, if you can't leave the house, how can you get help and the protection you need? How can you call for advice when your abuser is in the next room? How do you move to a group shelter when you're worrying about your child contracting COVID? That's why it's so important that states and NGOs from all over the world talk to one another. We need to discuss what we've tried, what works, what doesn't work, and what lessons we can share. And with that, I'll pass over to our moderator, Richie van Herdingen, CEO of Care Nederland. But if I can just add a personal congratulations, Richie has signed up to become an international gender champion herself. Welcome to the group, and we're glad to have your support. Thank you so much, Ms. Ambassador. That is a very nice and honoring piece of news. Um, and welcome to all of you. It was already a great honor to be in the position to moderate the session on the impact of the quarantine measures on, on domestic violence. And indeed, I, I work for CARE. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are an international NGO that comes in action for humanitarian crises worldwide and has done so for the past 75 years and always with a very specific focus on gender equality. That's why I'm extra happy to be in the position to moderate this session today. And we have a fantastic and impressive set of speakers who will give us more insights um, from the different countries that they uh, come from. And I will introduce them to you in a minute. I just wanted to set the stage real quick for the speakers and for you with uh, a bit of information on when the COVID-19 crisis emerged and spread and the subsequent lockdowns were put in place. CARE did a rapid gender analysis of the, the global impact 
and its gendered consequences for, for different groups of the population. And what struck us immediately was indeed, and you've already mentioned it, the, the, the enormous consequences of the economic insecurity, loss of income opportunities and stress in general, that leads to increased gender-based violence. The, and you will have seen the numbers from different countries that are confirming this. And likely those numbers only show us the tip of the iceberg, as survivors of domestic violence are likely to not uh, be in the condition to report. Furthermore, we also know that survivors of domestic violence will not have easy access to, to services of the, because of the conditions that were already mentioned by, by the ambassadors, and that that access decreases even under crisis-affected circumstances. And then these services are often not considered important enough since they're not regarded as life-saving services, which they in fact are. I'm therefore very happy to introduce our first speaker who will give us much more profound insight in this and who has also been looking into solutions for it. And this is Dylan Black, an established feminist and anti-violence activist in Ottawa. Um, Dylan is a 2SL LGBTQI plus rights activist in Ottawa and is working on a PhD on in the intersections of gender-based violence and surveillance. Furthermore, since 2018, if I understand that correctly, Dylan will correct me, um, Dylan was appointed to the Prime Minister of Canada's Gender Equality Advisory Council for Canada's G7 pres presidency and is also on the advisory committee on the federal strategy on gender-based violence. So a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of experience, and Dylan will give us uh, a great perspective on the situation that we're dealing with here. Please go ahead, Dylan. Hi, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for having me and for putting on this uh, wonderful and critical event. I think trying to understand the gendered impacts of COVID-19 is absolutely critical to developing solutions that are innovative and also meet the needs of those who are most marginalized in our communities. As we know, rates of gender-based violence were high in Canada even before the pandemic. On average, every six days, a woman is killed by her intimate partner, for example. Thousands of women and girls and transgender people now face a heightened risk of violence at home with COVID-19 isolation measures. In a recent Statistics Canada survey about COVID-19, highlighted for us that one in 10 women are very extremely concerned about the possibility of violence at home. Crisis situations always have a heavy impact on victims and survivors of violence, especially those who are also members of, our, of marginalized communities, such as people of color, migrant communities, 2S LGBTQI plus people, as well as people who are living in poverty or maybe don't have citizenship or status. In a lot of ways, what we're seeing is that survivors of gender-based violence are caught between two pandemics. The pandemic of gender-based violence that has, that has existed for the last you know, 50, 30 years with rates often remaining unchanged, as well as the current pandemic of COVID-19. For a lot of folks, social isolation means staying at home, but as we have heard, for a lot of folks, homes can be unsafe. And I think while physical distancing is perhaps the best practice in health prevention, it is also exactly the type of behaviors that perpetrators use to exert power and control. If a victim lives with an abuser, they may be at risk for sexual and domestic violence at home. Um, and I think sexual violence is also very important to kind of note here because what we're also seeing in Canada, and I'm not sure if this is the same in Sweden and Denmark and other countries across the world, but there is a lot of sexual exploitation and sexual assault happening, um, particularly around, um, you know, if people are unable to pay their rent, um, oftentimes landlords are using this uh, to exploit them and, and using exchange of sex in, in non-consensual ways. So that is also something that I kind of wanted to highlight. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been linked to a lot of spikes in domestic violence reports and crisis calls in China and France, for example. And in the UK, we're seeing an increase in sexual assault and sexual exploitation, and there are alarming rates of domestic homicide. So for example, in the UK, we've seen a doubling of domestic homicide. In Canada, we're seeing an elevated number of cases of domestic homicide. And more recently in Nova Scotia, um, there was a mass shooting where 17 people were murdered. And that mass shooting uh, began with a lot of red flags that would 
give us the context of domestic violence that was missed. In Canada, service providers have also observed increases over the past few weeks. Um, for example, the Ontario Association of Interval Houses and Transition Houses says that 20% of the 70 shelters it represents have increased crisis calls. And some police services also report noticing more reports of domestic violence, as well as domestic violence related homicide. Again, due to COVID-19, victims may have less access to outside resources, um, going to the office, being able to be out in public spaces, running errands. These were all ways that survivors used to connect with much needed support. And now they're not able to do so, which is really cutting off a very incredibly important uh, way for them to connect with us. Um, additionally, heightened stress and tension in the home may contribute to an increase in controlling and abusive behavior. And also we're, we're seeing some new ways that abuse is kind of manifesting. Uh, abusers may seek to limit information about COVID-19 or use the virus specifically as an excuse to control finances, police um, a victim's body or their behavior, and as well as cut off contact with friends and family and make threats to hold, withhold vital resources. Neighbors, friends, and families are on the front lines of these issues, but we're not necessarily able to connect either. You know, usually we would tell people, if you see your neighbor, if there's something off or not right, uh, maybe you haven't seen them in a few weeks or their mail is piling up, then that would be a question of concern. But because we're all practicing social distance, that makes it a lot hard, harder for our communities to respond in a way that is supportive towards, survivor, towards survivors. So while the path ahead looks daunting, it doesn't mean that we can't do anything about what's happening. Um, so for us in our community, we decided to, to respond proactively. As soon as COVID-19 measures uh, were being announced, we, we knew that survivors would not be able to reach out to us in the ways that we're used to. So this is why we created Unsafe at Home Ottawa, which is a collaboration between five different violence against women organizations here in Ottawa. And it is a secure text and online chat service for women who may be living through increased domestic violence and abuse at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our counselors provide emotional support, practical advice, referrals, as well as, as safety planning for survivors who are stuck at home. Because one thing that we do know is that despite being stuck at home, there are still ways for us to help and support survivors to stay safer. So for example, uh, areas like kitchens and bathrooms are often more dangerous areas in a home so we can work together with the survivor to ensure that they're as safe as, as possible. And throughout this process, um, survivors' needs were always at the center of, de of decisions that we made. Um, for us, survivor safety and privacy is always important. So this is why when we were adopting this new technology during COVID-19, we needed to ensure that personal safety, loss of privacy, and confidentiality were absolutely critical measures that we needed to take into consideration, which is why our platform specifically um, offers zero knowledge encryption, which means that we actually control all of the data on the servers. And what this is able, allowed us to do is that we're able to erase that data and, and messages on our chat line at intervals that we control. We're able to disconnect chats that become idle, or we might think that an abuser has intercepted um, intercepted that moment. Um, and we also provide a lot of different safety features around um, assessing for spyware and compromised devices, as well as training advocates to use code words in the event that we're not sure if a survivor is safe while they're connecting with us. So this for us is really important because it allows survivors a very discreet and useful way to connect with us, even though they might not have that privacy in the home that they used to. And other things that our organizations have done in our communities is ensure that we set up a specific isolation center for survivors and women who are fleeing domestic violence. We worked with our hospitals to establish domestic violence related medical help because we know that those survivors are sustaining quite serious injuries at home. They are afraid to reach out to medical professionals um, for fear of odor, overburdening the system, but also because they're afraid of contracting COVID-19. And also we're currently in, in the works to secure technology and tablets for families who are living in domestic violence shelters, uh, specifically those with children, because we really want them to be able to stay connected, uh, to not experience increased rates of mental health, but also because we know children still need to go to school and learning still needs to happen. So just having access to that technology is absolutely vital to ensuring that these families um, can get ahead and, and come out of this on the other side. So those are just some of the examples that we've kind of worked on here in Canada, or at least in Ottawa, 
Um, I'm going to continue and let the next speaker uh, move forward, but I would be happy to answer any questions uh, after this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dylan. I think this is a great example of how you develop solutions based on a true understanding of the needs of the survivors and working together with local stakeholders. It would be really interesting to hear later on from you if this is something that can then also be done on, in other places in Canada, if this is something that can be scaled. I think there will be a lot of curiosity around that, but it, I think it's really interesting that you build it up from that local understanding. Um, but we will definitely get into that later on. I, Ola Florin, um, he is working with the, uh, coordinating several government initiatives related to Sweden's cross-sectoral 10-year national strategy for preventing and combating men's violence against women. So this is a 10-year strategy from 2017 to 2026. And there is um, a government uh, body from which the initiatives of the government are coordinated and um, Ola is responsible for that. Um, he has a background in social policy, in child rights, and in sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, and from his experience on how the, the COVID crisis has evolved in Sweden and what the, the measures of this interagency um, body have been, Ola will now give us his view on the developments in Sweden. Now I'm jumping it on you. You may have to start without your slides, Ola. Okay, that's fine. Um, but um, it's on my laptop, so I could just very easily open the presentation if someone could just guide me. Should and I sh the click the, the share screen? Yeah. The share screen button. Okay. I think that will help. Yeah, and then um, you click on your presentation. Yeah, but it doesn't come up. That's oh, perhaps files or advanced. Hmm. But feel free okay. to just walk us through. Yeah. I know it's an interesting story, so you might as well just. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try to comment machine gun rhythm then on domestic mm -hmm. violence in Sweden in light of um, the ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 from a national perspective. And this is quite a challenge given the rapid real-time changes of a new pandemic that we are struggling to understand, as well as pre-existing knowledge gaps associated with domestic violence. By European standards, Sweden is sparsely, a sparsely populated country, though it must be recognized that the majority of the population is uh, residing in the southern part of the country, uh, mainly in um, three urban regions, of which um, Stockholm so far has been the most severely affected by the pandemic. The first case was confirmed in late January. So we've been living this situation for three and a half months. In terms of deaths per 1 million people, Sweden, as of yesterday, had a lower number than various other countries, yet much higher than its Nordic neighbors. And the country sticks out by um, a comparatively lenient approach to controlling the disease. There is no mandatory curfew, quarantine, or lockdown, but strong recommendations, for instance, concerning the whereabouts of those aged over 70 and other risk groups. Preschools and compulsory schools have been running throughout this period of time. In Sweden, domestic violence is defined in line with the Istanbul Convention, that is, uh, all acts, it concludes all acts of violence that occur within the family or domestic unit, regardless of location, as well as intimate partner violence. And uh, reliable estimates of prevalence are difficult to make, partly because of the barriers to disclosure inherent in such relationships. In 2018, almost 20,000 women in Sweden stated that they had been subject to assault in the previous 12 months, causing them injuries that required health care or dental care. 
And the same year, more than 4,800 women were registered by the health care system uh, with uh, injuries caused by external violence. Uh, and um, last year, 25 women were killed um, by violence and 16 or 64 percent of these women were killed by a partner or ex-partner. There has been a long-term decline of deadly and gross violence against women in Sweden, but the past two years represent a negative break uh, in this regard. The Swedish municipalities are under a legal obligation to provide crime victim support though, um, um, through the social services and the regions are responsible for health care services. There are at least 200 shelters across the country and various helplines, including the National Helpline for Women Subjected to Violence and a new regional pilot phone service for potential offenders aiming at motivating them to seek treatment for aggressive behavior and uh, aggressive and violent behavior. Under the influence of international debate um, and calls by civil society organizations, the government and other authorities has acknowledged how the pandemic and associated measures of disease control may have detrimental effects for those who are already suffering uh, domestic violence trigger more violence and impede access to support and protection. In addition, the pandemic may have long-term consequences such as recession, job loss, drinking and drug addiction, impoverished mental health, etc., that often imply fertile ground for domestic violence. So far, uh, the police authority and the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention has noticed an overall reduction in violent crimes reported to the police, but an increase in intimate partner violence during the first month of the year, followed by a decline in April. The national helplines for children and women are reporting an increased number of calls, although the helpline for women claims that the growth in their case is long-term preceding the pandemic. The hotline for potential perpetrators reports an increasing number of calls the first weeks of the pandemic, but mainly from people who do not belong to the target group, including victims. We get a mixed picture of um, the demand for and access to sheltered accommodation. Various public institutions are under strain, but it is difficult to determine to what extent this is affecting victims and perpetrators of domestic violence. A significant number of social workers in Stockholm report that their safety equipment is insufficient and their union specifically points out that meeting adults and children in real life is often crucial for detecting violence. Um, among the actions taken by the government uh, are um, the following. There is an int intensified dialogue with uh, civil society organizations, municipalities, regions and government agencies. Additional funding has been provided for the municipalities and regions and the Agency for Gender Equality has been commissioned to support municipalities in disseminating information on violence to vulnerable groups. Additional funding has also been provided for civil society, organizations res responding to domestic violence. And uh, there has been a reinforcement of helpline services in terms of staffing, hours of operation, and uh, advertising. And some concluding remarks. There was uh, earlier the awareness uh, considerable media coverage and debate in Sweden um, and uh, some suitable measures were taken prior to the pandemic uh, such as online training of professionals. Safety equipment to allow for face-to-face -face interaction and outreach work is vital and a severe challenge. 
With or without COVID-19, violence against women and domestic violence is a disaster in its own right. So the general priorities of the Swedish national strategy remain. We need to enhance and, uh, pre prevention and make it more effective through uh, greater involvement of men and boys and um, primary interventions with these target groups. We need uh, improved detection, protection and support. Crime control needs to be more effective and we need to improve knowledge and development and methods. There are interesting experiences in other countries that we haven't identified, including measures against perpetrators, such as uh, application of restraining orders and devices for easy access to victim protection and support. There is um, a permanent challenge of follow-up and statistics, um, but it is of course uh, extremely relevant under the current circumstances uh, so that we can learn from um, um, the situation and, and the impact of the pandemic. There is inconclusive evidence on, on the impact of COVID-19 on domestic violence still. Um, but um, we should also keep in mind that uh, the, the, the lockdown in Sweden has been soft and there has been uh, limited quarantine. So hopefully uh, this also means that uh, at least for now, um, uh, we can still um, carry out services and reach uh, those in, in, in need and uh, maintain uh, a sufficient level of uh, protection. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ola. Um, for giving us a perspective from a, a national uh, government's point of view with uh, a different or an additional set of challenges. In interesting that you also mentioned the, the need to work with men and boys, as we know that this is also a social norms issue that can also be approached by working specifically with that group as well. Um, I understand that we now have Renee on the line. Am I correct, Renee? Hi, Renee. Can you uh, do you hear us? Can you? Uh... Yes, I've I've been able to hear you all the time. So that's oh, great. That's perfect. Then please go ahead, Renee. I I did an introduction. I indeed have now the honor to introduce the next speaker to you uh, from the Netherlands, Professor Renee Ramkens. She is currently a professor at the University of Amsterdam on gender-based violence. Um, she used to be for seven years. The past seven years the director of Atria. Atria is the, the Dutch National Institute on Gender Equality and Women's History. And apart from that, uh, Renee has also worked, she's a very established uh, academic researcher, has worked on a national survey on intimate partner violence against women, which has become a landmark study, um, and also contributed to the drafting of the Council of Europe Convention to prevent and combat violence against women and domestic violence, which is known as the Istanbul Convention, which I know Renee will tell us more about, so I will not steal that thunder from her and give the floor to Renee. Hey, I, I did an introduction about your background already that you may have heard as well. So please feel yeah, free to share your perspectives yeah. with us. Uh, thank you so much, Renke. There is a little echo on the line, but I trust that you can hear me directly. Yeah, now. yeah, we hear you very well. So thanks for the uh, other interesting presentations that I was able to hear in between the instructions I uh, received <laughs> to get me uh, online. Uh, my presentation is um, from the perspective of um, 
being an academic uh, who is um, involved in research, um, particularly policy development and the impact of a legal regulation on violence against women. Um, I have three points I would like to make, given that we're entering a very complex domain where a lot is happening, basically. Uh, the first one is about policy measures in the Netherlands. The second one is on the data um, and notably the lack of data that we're struggling with. Not only I hear that in some of the other uh, presenters have addressed that as well. And this, the third point is about what are the state obligations really and how do they relate to what is currently happening. Um, to start with one, the uh, policy measures that have been taken in the Netherlands so far, particularly um, related to corona and domestic violence. Uh, very specifically, um, the government has installed an alarm code, similar to the one that has been uh, launched in France, um, the so-called Mask 19 code. So that means that a pharmacist are, I think I got lost here. No, we can, we can still hear can you. Hear I just uh, turned off the echo. Yeah. Oh, okay. It means that I cannot see you anymore. Oh, pardon me. As soon as you're done speaking, I'll put that back on. It was just to solve the echo. Okay, great. Okay. So to continue about the alarm code, it basically means that a woman can go to a pharmacist and use the term mask 19. And that is the signal for the pharmacist to um, assist in finding help for the woman. It's, an, it's a call for help, basically, a, a masked code, so to speak. Um, that has been launched about 10 days ago in the Netherlands. And um, actually, Today, one of the national newspapers um, re uh, published a report on the experiences so far, and they did an interview with 25 pharmacies in the Netherlands, uh, spread over the country. Um, this is clearly not all the pharmacies in the Netherlands, it's a, it's a sample, but it was intended to give an impression how is this uh, measure working. And the uh, sad conclusion is that it's actually hardly working at all. There's only one woman who has uh, used the code as in these 25, in this sample of 25. But um, when the chair of the pharmacy um, professional organization was interviewed, um, he declined actually to give any numbers. And he said, well, we do not register this as pharmacies because um, who would like to register this? And um, just for your information, I'm now seeing a totally black screen, so I have no idea whether you can hear me or um, I just no, we, trust. We, we can hear you. Everything's going great. Yeah. We can okay, hear you well, good. Renee. I'll I just think everybody continue. Can. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so it means that um, it is very questionable whether this measure is working. The, the feedback that was given by the pharmacists that had been interviewed was that this measure had been implemented um, basically top down. The government, the government, Dutch government had copied the French um, uh, measure without really seriously consulting with the pharmacies. And the pharmacists that had been interviewed said, actually, we do not quite know what to do. We do not know whether we have to call the police. We do not know whether we have to call um, a, a helpline. Um, so the bottom line is, um, I think it's um, with best intentions, it was copied, but it is kind of um, sloppy, if you could put it that way, because there it seems that the, the policymakers who installed it not only have not really engaged the professional, uh, the professionals who are um, expected to implement this measure, but also underrate the seriousness of the 
problem at stake. As we all know, um, as experts in this field, domestic violence is not simply a social problem or a relational issue. So um, the lack of knowledge and lack of training among, among pharmacists, which is quite understandable because clearly domestic violence is not their core a business, so to speak, should have been addressed. And what um, I just learned before this meeting is that they are planning to train pharmacists in the fall of 2020, which is, um, again, a laudable that there is an initiative to train pharmacists, but the crisis is going on now and the lockdown is going on now. So we're not quite sure how that addresses the problems that they are running into now. The second measure that has been taken uh, by the government is an awareness raising campaign. Uh, this started uh, also about 10 days ago. And it's, um, it, it consists of uh, radio commercials mainly, um, calling upon people to call a helpline. Um, so that is an important uh, measure taken to raise basically the, the, not only the seriousness, but the urgency of the issue of domestic violence in terms of corona. Um, a few comments that have come up um, is that this uh, campaign is strikingly gender neutral. Uh, it only talks about persons, uh, it talks about children, um, and this is actually a trend that is going on since the turn of the millennium in the Netherlands, this increasing use of gender neutral framing um, that actively opposes addressing the problems in terms of women or men, or that even addressing or acknowledging, I should say, the fact that domestic violence affects women um, uh, more women than men, and in a more serious way. Um, th th there is in that respect already for a while um, a gender backlash going on. Um, as, a, as an academic, I have been, um, have been raising this for, for uh, a while now, and, um, and it is a growing concern of policymakers also, because um, policymakers basically um, have asked for advice on how to address, in, in, I mean, in, in behind closed doors, they have asked for advice, how to address the gendered nature of the issue without using the term gender, because the minister uh, is firmly opposed to using the term. So there is clearly a political ideological issue going on, which is, is complicating matters. Um, having said that, it means that uh, I've asked to, uh, I've tried to gain data on whether the campaign is working and whether the number of calls to the uh, helpline that is intended to, um, to receive the calls actually is growing, and it is not. Um, the latest figures indicate that there is no increase whatsoever in the Netherlands of help calls. And some of the experts in the field um, attribute this to this gender neutral framing of the campaign, um, creating unintentionally basically an obstacle for people to recognize themselves in what is going on or um, not really pushing them to address the issue directly because the framing of the campaign is in rather, let's say, general terms and really emphasizing that it is about relational stress uh, between partners or parents and children and not really explicitly framing it as an issue of abuse, as an issue of power, as an issue of violence. So it, according to experts who uh, were asked to explain why they didn't get a raise in calls, even though people are encouraged to do so, say that the campaign might not be the right uh, frame for people to identify with. Um, so that is actually a very um, uh, interesting yet also worrying aspect of what we see in the Netherlands, and um, which is also 
seems to be at this point different from um, countries, um, other countries in Europe, and maybe also Canada, um, where um, particularly women do succeed in finding the way to helplines. And you see a slight increase or do call to the police, also police um, help calls. Uh, I did a last check this morning, had not increased in the Netherlands over the past eight weeks. So there is something remarkable going on. It might be, um, from my research experience and from studies that have been done in the past about how the police handle domestic violence calls, it might be that the explanation is partially a registration deficit, that people do call but that the police doesn't register it as such and immediately passes it on to um, the helpline that I mentioned before, the telephone mm -hmm. helpline. Yet, in that case, if that would be the case, then there would still be, have to be an increase in the numbers that come in uh, with helplines, which is not the case. So there is something happening in the Netherlands, um, as uh, some of you already addressed, we have unfortunately every reason to believe that domestic violence uh, is most likely on the increase in these times of corona, or at least those who were struggling with, with it need different kinds of help because they, they have limitations in where to go to, but the signals do not reach the outside world, one could say, in the Netherlands. So I think it's, there's reason for concern. And actually, we're, we are addressing this with uh, a few researchers in the field to see whether we can set up a study um, to find out rather sooner rather than later whether we, we have a reason for concern and what could be done to address it. So. Yeah. That is the second point. Just very quickly, the third point, state obligations. Um, some of the European partners might know there is a particular human rights treaty of the Council of Europe, the Istanbul Convention, uh, addressing state obligations to prevent and uh, support victims of domestic violence and violence against women in general. Um, various measures uh, um, are expected from the state and in that respect, particularly looking at through a gender lens and also through, let's say, more intersectional perspective that the report of care so excellently has addressed, um, is clearly not being uh, realized at this point in time. So mm. I think it is important to look at state obligations according to international law that can give a a useful framework to address our concerns. I think Thank I'll leave you, it Renee. And that is then also where the Istanbul Convention would come in, right? Excuse me, I, I, I got a message muted, unmute, so I didn't hear your question. Okay, no, I, I would say that that is then also where the Istanbul Convention that you referred to earlier comes in as a framework that will help us to, to obligate states. Absolutely. To and this. also yeah. from, an, um, from an intersectional perspective. So looking at particular groups in society that might be more vulnerable than others, yeah. thinking of migrants, thinking of low income people, uh, yeah. thinking of uh, people from the LHBTI community, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. I think we've had, uh, we've received different perspectives from a more national level, from a local level, and looking at where the, the, the gaps are in, in terms of information, in terms of action. And I think it would be, since we are left with a 10 minute uh, time slot for questions, I think it would be interesting to, to go to some questions and answers from the audience. There is one in the, in the chat box for Dylan, assuming Dylan is still there behind a very beautiful picture. <laughs> there you are. Hello. Um, there is a question on how, in, in the case of Canada, courts are uh, handling protection orders and other legal protective tools during uh, COVID times and how governments could be using the kind of technology you develop to improve access to courts and protection. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a legal expert, but I can tell you a little bit about some of the, I guess, barriers to legal responses and support for families, particularly around like family law and domestic violence. I know that there, um, you know, with the closures of the courts and the, you know, lack of access to services or even um, supervised access centers is causing a lot of um, strain for a lot of uh, families, particularly those who, you know, are dealing with child custody issues or again, maybe applying for child, uh, sorry, for court or protection orders and these sorts of things. So, right. and also another kind of aspect of, of the COVID-19 pandemic was there had been a lot of early release of, of, you know, low offenders, but a lot of survivors of domestic violence weren't necessarily being notified that their abuser was being released from prison. So there's a lot of concern around safety planning and harm and and also the enforcement of things like protection orders and, and these sorts of things, or peace bonds, which, um, which is what we call them in Canada. Um, I do know that those are kind of some of the issues or the barriers that a lot of people are seeing. Um, provincially, different. Uh, there are different kind of ways that, that courts and, and legal systems are navigating these pieces. Um, for example, in Alberta, um, for the justice of the peace, they have after hours services, they have online case conferencing. Um, they also have created an emergency protection order program specifically for to, do, to deal with uh, domestic violence and, and kind of the worries around those pieces. But I think um, technologically there is a lot of innovation. And again, just in considering um, privacy and confidentiality, absolutely. Any new adoption of technology needs to ensure that Again, you know, survivors' privacy um, is at the utmost kind of center of those decisions. But yep. I, we have seen lots of different ways in which our provincial governments are kind of either extending services, moving online, or or developing these emergency programs to ensure that those protection orders um, are are getting in, and also police services uh, being able to let the community know that they are still um, investing and in, in all the measures that they're taking to ensure that they're uh, violence against women programs are actually, you know, still um, answering calls and, you know, using protective equipment and, and particularly in the case of domestic violence. So yeah. those are some of the things that we've seen in, in Canada around mm. the legal aspect, but it is definitely a huge issue. Absolutely. Yeah. But still, it sounds like there is uh, more interaction between stakeholders than what we got from Renee's uh, analysis of the Netherlands. I, I have a few follow-up questions, and this is also to an initiative that um, uh, Renee mentioned on the Mask 19 initiatives. And her question to you, Dylan, and also to Ola is if there's, um, uh, that's Lisa's question, if there are initiatives similar to that Mask, we know that the, it, it is an initiative in France and in Spain, but the Mask 19 initiative as a way for women to anonymously flag that they have an issue with this. Is that something that is happening in Sweden or in Canada? Um, on, just, and then I, I'll we, give the word to Ola. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so we definitely have heard about the code word uh, in the pharmacies, for example, and we are exploring ways in which um, which we kind of implement something similar. We're also talking about, you know, um, developing ways for, for example, like Uber and these kind of, uh, you know, food services that are doing delivery, deliveries and these sorts of things to be able to um, either connect domestic violence survivors with resources. So like, let's say they're ordering food or takeout, mm. there would be, you know, a flyer pamphlet that is part of that package or, or ways that the delivery services can also connect with survivors. So we're thinking about that. And then mm. also there's a signal on Zoom as well. So if you're there's a particular hand gesture that you can use via Zoom. So, um, and then we're just ensuring that neighbors, friends, and families know that, you know, during COVID-19, that there are ways that you can still check in on your neighbors or people in your network, even despite social distancing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but the pharmacy code word was, at, was really yeah. innovative. And we, we definitely have heard about that. Yeah, it sounds like you're bringing it very close to where the survivors are, which is great. Um, Ola, any, any experience in Sweden around this kind of initiative? There is no um, equivalent um, at national level involving pharmacies. Um, no, but there um, um, we've uh, learned about uh, the um, app, app L, this um, 
um, device uh, that has been launched in, in France, um, developed in, in France. And there's a, a, a similar, I believe, app solution developed by um, young people in, in southern Sweden. Um, but we received information on it uh, this morning, so we, we haven't uh, okay. had the time to review it yeah. carefully. There is also a, a, a very broad um, work involving many different agencies uh, in um, training professionals on r routinely asking uh, clients uh, about their experiences of, of um, violence, and it continues um, th uh, during um, the, co the pandemic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna go to another question, Karin de Jonge. Hi, Karin. A question on whether there's any evidence of specific impact on migrant families, either in Canada, in Sweden, or in the Netherlands, to any of the speakers have any information about that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ola, since you're yeah. on the big screen. Yeah. Um, uh, NGOs <clears throat> working with migrant communities report that um, uh, young women um, suffer uh, violence um, uh, in the name of honor and uh, because um, of um, online uh, distance um, learning. Uh, they spend more time at, at home and they may be um, under pressure to, to marry uh, this um, is being reported by by um, uh, local NGOs working mm. with migrant communities. Then, uh, of course, we have uh, a severe problem of um, eth ethnified uh, segregation in, um, especially in in um, urban the urban regions, yeah. and and we know that that um, both migrant children of a migrant background as well as women of migrant background are overrepresented uh, among those who report experience from domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I had the impression that Renee was going to add something. Was, am I correct, Renee? Did I see you pop up? Um, no, but, what, but maybe you read my, my mind. I was what, reading your mind. I, Go ahead. Yeah. No, but what I could... Um, uh, add is that um, there is a concern among uh, uh, shelters in the Netherlands that migrant women are even more um, pushed back, so to speak, in terms of having access to facilities. And But as I um, said in my presentation, we have a, really a lack of solid data or more reliable data. The other thing that I think is not a complete coincidence is that we had a, a family killing, as it is called, in um, the second half of March, just as I went in, and a woman and her two children were um, killed by the husband, and that was a migrant family. Mm. Um, but again, we have to be careful. It's anecdotal evidence, but um, at the same time, this as as, as been said before, also in related to unrelated violence, might be bigger on um, different backgrounds at this point in time. Mm. Well, the last sentence is getting lost a bit, Renee. Can the you repeat? other thing that is also, um, I think, worth mentioning is the now, Renge, there was a was bad connection. I I can't really get what you say, Renee. Did any of the organizers? Can you repeat it once more, Renee? Last question. The last I'm sentence. Now. Sorry. 
No. Yes. I think the connection got a bit worse. But I can hear Renee's writing something. Um, maybe in the meantime, there's also a question from someone working at an international organization, whether COVID-19, the, the, the mask-19 code. Um, I, I can repeat it. Can you hear this? I can hear you intermittently. Yeah. I think the line is indeed blurry. Do you want to try that again, your last sentence? I don't seem to be working anymore with that. Would there be, and, and maybe I... Um, I don't think it has that much. It has been addressed already by Ola. Or that okay. My point is that we do have to be aware that women from migrant communities um, are uh, particularly vulnerable. And um, so I do think that we have not addressed yet that yeah. within refugee communities, okay. that there is a special vulnerability also. Yeah, clear. Um, I may take some of the few, um, I'm looking at the organizers again, if we can have a few minute, more minutes to ask Dylan about attention for um, refugee communities migrant communities in Canada. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, Hi. our organization, so we do partner a lot with um, Immigrant Women Services, for example, and a lot like what Renee was speaking about, there are serious concerns around, um, you know, for example, around residency, around uh, work permits, for example, a lot of the um, public services are closed, so the ability to be able to renew work permits is really um, concerning, particularly for migrant communities, mm. and also just um, the, the the condition conditions of res residency is for particular people who are migrants, as well as access to healthcare. Um, there's a lot of barriers for you know uh, non-status people, for example, generally to access healthcare. Um, we're trying to adopt a, a sanctuary. A city kind of model here in Ottawa, but just you know, ensuring that public health services are remind folks that you know, even if they don't necessarily have citizenship, that they're still able to access the the healthcare that they need, especially during a time of a pandemic. And also, there's a lot of economic strains currently, so a lot of migrant people um, rely on the economy in order to access their work permits and these sorts of things. So those yeah. are some of the pieces that we're hearing um, from a service provision lens. There's a lot of complexity around um, serving newcomer and immigrant communities. Um, access to interp interpretation, for example, um, is a really big thing for us here in Ottawa. Um, and just being able to develop the technology in order to get those interpreters to be able to connect women to services yeah. is generally really difficult. Um, but in the context of COVID-19, it's even more imperative to do so. So we're trying to find some innovative solutions um, to do that. So, for example, in our chat service, um, we just uh, created a, a feature where you can bring a third party into the chat in the event that someone needs an interpreter to be able to, to communicate okay. with, the, with the counselor. So yeah, those are some of the pieces that we're looking at. But language barriers and language learning is absolutely like very much... Um, a big issue and then just access to interpreters whatsoever yeah. so yeah yeah that speaks to the question i see a question from Lorianne in the um, in the chat box it was about whether and i'm going to ask you now dylan taking advantage whether um the the mask 19 code is something you would continue to recommend in spite of of that in, in holland it doesn't seem to have picked up that well but she's also uh, Lorianne is referring also to um what other resources are well suited, especially for non, in our case, non-Dutch speaking people? And you're speaking already to the, the barrier of language. Would you then say that such a mask 19 code or other examples that you gave are a good way of, of reaching, of, of survivors like that being able to reach out? Yeah, I think the mask 19 um, 
is really great for the general public in terms of knowing um, how a survivor is able to reach out. What we're finding is more effective, particularly reaching marginalized communities, and this is kind of something that we're exploring in a lot of different ways, is actually going to um, those communities and community leaders. So whether it's you know faith-based groups, um, places where those communities generally might access support initially, because what we see here in Canada is that particular communities, especially newcomer and immigrant communities, don't uh, reach out to services in, in ways that you know other communities might. So it's actually going to those community leaders and those, those spaces themselves and ensuring that at least that information is is there. So for example, you know, we talk to a lot of you know community developers and people who are working in those communities and they have those connections established already and just ensuring that they have the information and the resources so that it can get um, you know brought to those communities versus you know just creating the signal and hoping that those communities will come to us. So I think for specific communities it is a little bit more um, about really connecting in that grassroots kind of way and just going to spaces mm. where those communities generally might uh, might get, come together. Maybe right now it's a little bit different, but even in online spaces, there are places where those communities access support that isn't inherently obvious or explicit to us. So we're just trying to make sure to be creative about it for sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. I'm getting signals from the organizers that we're going past the hour and I could continue this and maybe some of the people on the call as well, but we are aware that there's people that are leaving the call that probably have other uh, obligations to attend to. So I think for now we are going to leave it at this, but I very much hope that this was only the start of a conversation. I think a few things were flagged, especially the fact that uh, sometimes, and especially in the Dutch case, at a national level or maybe in, gen in general, the there's not really enough awareness and not enough understanding of the seriousness of this issue and how it comes with uh, the kind of crisis that we are living through which as a dutch person i think is, is really alarming and at the same time the encouraging idea that there's also ways of in the case of sweden at a national level to work across different agencies and create coherence among different stakeholders to, to act upon the issues that we're talking about. I'm very much encouraged by the Ottawa experience that um, Dylan has shared, where it seems that being so close to where the communities are, where the survivors sit, you can really tailor make solutions to what is really needed in very specific um, situations that seem to be very clear for you with a, a lot of understanding from from you and your organization of what is going on and i think that is a very inspiring and encouraging example thank you very much to all of you for for sharing your experiences um, and i'm reading now quickly before i say goodbye from annika that we really have to and i completely agree we have to find ways and means to continue this dialogue because the the pandemic is not over yet the shadow pandemic is not over yet and i entirely agree with annika and would love to support that and i see others are supporting it as well that this is a dialogue that needs to continue so i i hope we can count also on ola dylan and Rene to continue this with us and we will find a way to do that Sure. Thank you very much. I don't know if one of the ambassadors wants to say something before we close. And I'm also not sure that they heard me. Just thanks to everyone who participated, especially to the organizers and to the participants and to you, Renji. Thank you very much. It's been really interesting. Very, very interesting indeed. I would like to thank you for having me here. I think it was very insightful. No. Thank you, Dylan, Olin, thank and Renee. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Renee, I'm not...